Um, today, I'm just going to be monitoring the chat, making sure people are getting into this webinar and making sure there's no chaos today. Beautiful. And we have Brett. Brett, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I, hello, everyone. My name is Brett, and I am uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Good Lawyer. I was a corporate year with, or uh, corporate lawyer, sorry, uh, with Josh actually for a number of years and uh, left the big shop to try to build something better, something a little more affordable and uh, a little more approachable than my uh, old life. So um, that's me and excited again to see everybody here today. This has been a great turnout. Joshua is uh, the most esteemed guest today, and uh, he's actually a lawyer for Good Lawyer and a strategic advisor to myself. So Josh and me go way back. He is a fantastic lawyer and uh, will be the meat and potatoes of today's presentation as we try to prepare all of you for your exciting fundraising journey. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Josh. He's going to kick things off with the 10,000 foot view of fundraising. Sounds good. Thanks, Brett, and uh, welcome everybody this afternoon. Uh, the first slide here, uh, as far as content goes, we want to give you the sort of big picture of um, what we're talking about here when we're talking about um, kind of the, the life cycle of the capital raising process. Uh, before I go through that, when, when we talk about capital raising in today's presentation, what we're talking about is um, really selling equity in your company. Um, we're looking at this from the perspective of uh, companies and corporations because the corporation is sort of the, the most common and the best vehicle for really um, you know, following through this capital raising process. And yeah, like I said, when we're talking about capital raising, we're talking about selling um, shares or common shares or equity in your business um, to other investors and to other stakeholders. Um, so they come on and they end up becoming an owner in your company. Um, so this 10,000 foot view, this is sort of, like I said, the life cycle of sort of um, in stage one, the initial incorporation and creation of your, of your company and your business um, through to in stage three, where you're dealing with more sophisticated institutional investors like angel investors, venture capital firms, private equity, that kind of thing. You're dealing with uh, actors and individuals and institutions in stage three whose uh, full-time job it is to identify companies and uh, place investments in those companies. For the bulk of our presentation today, we're gonna start uh, in stages one and two. Stage three is a bit more sophisticated and uh, a little bit kind of its, its own entity and further down the line. And what we want to do is, is spend enough time talking about one and two so essentially we can understand how important it is to sort of move uh, through one and two with sort of good rigor and good, uh, good rigor and thought so that when we get to stage three, uh, we're not uncovering uh, some some landmines or some, uh, some issues that we hadn't dealt with before that sort of complicates the, the process as we go. Absolutely. And, you know, again, from like a founder's perspective, I was a corporate lawyer in my past life, but as a founder, setting yourself up for success, you know, we all dream about raising that big VC round and we talk about unicorns, but really setting yourself up for success from day one starts with how are you papering things? How are you um, documenting the relationship between you and your co-founders? Because that is instrumental to setting you up for success forever and then again family and friends round maybe some you know an local angels would sort of fit into that category for you um, but really this is how most startups and most companies get off the ground from an investment perspective so as important and as sexy as the angels and vcs that sort of piece of it is we really want to harp on the importance of setting yourself up for success as a founder from day one and that starts with the founders of agreements as Josh is going to get into. Yeah, so uh, this next slide is kind of building on uh, really the case for legal and why you want to get um, lawyers involved in the capital raising process and why you want to seek advice from somebody like myself or somebody on the good lawyer uh, platform that can sort of help guide you through it. And uh, we've kind of broken this down into into three you know, key principles or three key lessons. Uh, the first is that 
um, lawyers can help smart founders protect themselves. And this is, you know, as we chat more today, you'll understand uh, with a little bit more detail what we're talking about. But uh, we're really here talking about uh, relationships between founders, your relationships and your roles with investors as you bring them in on board. And anytime you do that, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit around the control of your business. Um, so dealing with lawyers and somebody that can help sort of structure and plan this capital raising steps and process for you can help you maintain control over your business. Um, stage, two, stage two here, or principle number two, is really about sort of the, the speed that you can move through a financing. Um, and, you know, for businesses like uh, you guys might be running, and certainly in the case of uh, Good Lawyer and my, uh, my experience with working with Brett, getting money in the door when you need it uh, quickly is, is really, really important. So dealing with lawyers that can help sort of structure that uh, can really accelerate that process so that you can get money in the door when you need it. And then the third principle is really that uh, lawyers can help you raise money cost effectively. And, and what we're talking about there is really by um, setting your business up in a clearly structured, well-defined way um, gives investors comfort to want to invest their hard-earned money into your business, into your dream, into your, into your company. And um, you can do that more cost effectively by setting up your business the right way in the first instance and by designing a financing um, in the first instance in a, in a well-structured and well-thought-out way rather than getting a whole bunch of feedback from potential investors and then going back and trying to uh, clean up issues that you hadn't maybe identified or maybe hadn't dealt with in the first instance. Absolutely. And, you know, just on that note as well, um, any lawyer is not going to solve your problem. You need lawyers that have experience setting up startups, setting up, you know, growth oriented tech companies. And you need lawyers that understand what that means for the broader, broader scheme of things. It's not just about getting incorporated and, you know, getting a check cut from your investor or your prospect investor. It's really about understanding how these things are going to play out over the life cycle. So, um, getting the right lawyer is, is truly critical. And, and, you know, I'm very grateful that I had Josh on our team because it, uh, it's a little scary raising your first round and, uh, having a trusted advisor there, you know, <laughs> let me sleep better. And also, you know, made sure that the end product was what I was looking for. And I guess I kind of jumped the gun there. Um, Josh, do you have anything else on that last slide? Um, no, just to say we're, we're going to jump into, um, you know, the, the first two stages, like I said, in, in a bit more detail. So we'll come back to that. But Brett, why don't you give sort of the, the high level overview, I guess, of, of the good lawyer experience? Yeah. And, you know, again, we thought that, you know, putting some of these dates and figures up there would really sort of make it a bit more tangible um, using good lawyer as the example. So you could see how we did it over the past few years. And so really when good lawyer started and it was just an idea and we were working out of our apartment and thinking about hiring our first developer who you know is now our amazing CTO. Um, it started by me and my original co-founder putting 25 grand into the company. And that number was a bit arbitrary. That was to be eligible for this thing called the Alberta Investor Tax Credit, which no longer exists, rest in peace. But uh, that's really what kicked things off. That was us indicating to one another that we were very serious about this. Um, and again, for us, the 25,000 number was really pegged because of that, that AITC incentive. Um, and we're going to get touch on incentives again a little bit later. Moving on to 2019, when we raised uh, you know, a little over 450,000 in our pre-seed from family and friends, mostly friends, uh, a little angel-like some of them. And again, this was um, a fast moving process because of the AITC. But really for me, it was important beyond just raising the money but actually raising money from people that I felt would add a ton of value beyond the dollars as, you know, good lawyer progressed into the future. So um, just a little snapshot of what we did. And we're going to dig into all these areas more closely. Okay. Um, stage one. So stage one is the founder investment. And uh, this is a stage that often gets overlooked because it really does coincide with um, 
the initial creation of the business. So um, when you first first have your idea and you first take the step of transitioning from your uh, from your idea stage to creating a company and setting up a, a corporate organization, this is where we're dealing typically with the founder investment. Um, for the purposes of my example here, I'm assuming that we have multiple founders because that's where things get uh, a little bit more complicated and a little bit more interesting. So in the context of multiple founders, um, what we're talking about is once we've created the company, we have to figure out uh, the roles and responsibilities as well as the, the relative ownership percentage of the company of the two founders. Now, um, like Brett mentioned in the good lawyer example, Brett and his co-founder actually put cash into the company in exchange for their ownership. Um, that's common. Um, another way that founders contribute to the company in exchange for their initial ownership percentage, it uh, often will come in the form of a contribution of assets to the company. Um, and those assets might be something like intellectual property. So uh, a founder might have a great business idea and they are selling or transferring their business idea, ownership of their business idea over from themselves personally over to the company in exchange for an ownership stake in the company. And then uh, the final sort of uh, most common contribution to the company in exchange for equity is uh, often referred to as sweat equity. So this is a situation where you have founders that are doing work for the company or anticipating that they're going to be doing work for the company on usually a full-time basis uh, in exchange for an ownership stake in the company. That, that situation ends up getting the most uh, sort of complex and has uh, some issues to consider around that because we can't always guarantee that a founder is going to end up putting all the time that they're committing to work in the company in exchange for that equity. So you might have a situation where a founder says, yeah, I'm going to work uh, in a full-time role uh, for the company in exchange for a 50% ownership stake in the company. And then if you have that founder not fulfilling those work commitments, well, how do you deal with the relative uh, allocation of ownership rights and equity that you've contributed to that uh, or that you've allocated to that founder? So um, on the legal side of things, what we can help you do is what we can help you, sorry, pardon me, what we can help you do is identify those different issues and identify those potential risks. We can sort of coach you through the process of um, allocating founder roles, allocating uh, decision-making responsibility among the founders, determining what is a kind of workable ownership percentage. So recognizing that uh, if Brett and I are founders in a company together and we decide that, yeah, we have to own this thing 50-50, well, a lawyer can help you understand that, okay, that's great, but now in order to get any decisions done and uh, on behalf of the business, Brett and I have to agree on everything. So nobody has control in that situation. Um, I guess the last point that I would uh, wanna make here is just in terms of the legal documentation that's sort of relevant to this uh, initial founder round of investment. Uh, what we're talking about are the initial incorporation documents of the company. There are certain things that should be built in there, as well as potentially uh, founder agreements or uh, shareholder agreements that are entered into between uh, the initial owners of the company. Thanks, Josh. And maybe just one, one thing that I'd like you to touch on just a little bit before we move on to another good lawyer experience slide is the concept of vesting. And vesting in or clawing back uh, founder equity, depending on one of you know if if a founder were to leave. Sure, uh, that's a good point. So um, I spoke about sort of the three ways that founders typically contribute to the company in exchange for equity. Um, if a, if a founder is contributing cash or property, so cash or intellectual property or some other hard asset, then usually we say that that equity vests right away and then that um, that uh, founder has immediate ownership to their uh, to their stake in the company where it gets kind of interesting is around this idea of 
uh, working for the company. And usually founders will, will say, well, if I'm going to work for the company, I have to earn in my equity ownership uh, rights in the company. So we'll issue the equity now on the assumption that Brett and I are each going to work for the business uh, on a full-time committed basis for a year. And then we work out some sort of legal mechanism whereby if I decide I no longer want to be a part of this business and I don't, uh, I want to follow a different path, we work through um, what's often referred to as a, a reverse vesting mechanism or a clawback mechanism whereby if I exit and I don't fulfill my, uh, my commitment to work for the company on a full-time basis for a year, there's some sort of mechanism whereby Brett or the company can purchase back, can claw back the equity that I took when we created the company uh, at a discounted rate or a nominal rate or that kind of thing. So that's sort of the concept of reverse vesting or a clawback from a founder. Beautiful. So again, just a, a little recap of my experience with Good Lawyer and this whole founder investment early stage sort of period of the company. Um, and just a few takeaways that I want everyone to kind of sit on and, and think about. One, first and foremost, you gotta choose your co-founders carefully. If you're building a company with uh, a group of your friends or your, you know, your peers, or your colleagues, it's really important that you are aligned on the future of the company. And you know, perhaps even more importantly than that, what each individual is willing to contribute and give to this and what other types of, you know, draws in their life they're going to have because building a startup, as I'm sure many of you are painfully aware is really hard. And there are a lot of great days, but there are a lot of dark days as well. And, you know, it's not the life for everyone. So even if you go into this with your best friend and, you know, everything's rosy at the outset, it's kind of like a prenup in the sense that, you don't know what the future is going to hold and making sure that you, you know, A, have chosen carefully, but then also B, laying out the roles and expectations and being able to point to something. If you or that other individual isn't really picking up the slack, that's really important. And that's something that we didn't really have, frankly, in the early stages of Good Lawyer. And, you know, thankfully, Good Lawyer stemmed from a house full of lawyers. So we were able to, to fix some of those mistakes early on. And Luckily that my you know, original co-founder was super reasonable on his departure and everything worked out, but it might not have. And by not really addressing the founder agreement properly at the outset, it could have derailed Good Lawyer's entire existence. So I can't stress enough, choose your co-founders carefully and make sure that you have had those tough discussions early on so that if something you know, unfortunate happens down the road, you're not left holding the bag of this company that, you know, half the ownership is gone and yet you're expected to carry it on forward. So really having those tough conversations early is the main point that I wanted to make here. On to the friends and family round, Josh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next stage of the, of the capital raising life cycle, um, by this stage, you've, you've set up your company, your founders know your um, respective roles and responsibilities, how decisions are made. You understand who owns uh, what piece of the company. And now you're at a stage where you're ready to bring a bit more cash into the company so that you can uh, essentially start to fund the company's upfront capital requirements, maybe so that you can pay for some market research, some product development, uh, maybe you're on the pathway to creating your sort of uh, your MVP, your minimum viable product. So you need to start bringing money in the door so you can start kind of testing your business out and growing it. So that's sort of the stage that we're that we're at now. Um, one thing that I, I want to uh, stress at this stage before we get to uh, item number two and who you're targeting when you're raising money. The strategic thing to think about uh, at this stage, you're bringing new stakeholders into the company. And just like you had to understand with your co-founder what uh, your respective roles and responsibilities and decision-making powers are, you have a similar sort of calculation to make when you start bringing other owners into your business, when you start bringing in more shareholders. And 
principally what you want to try to do at this stage is make sure that you are maintaining the types of control over the business um, that you want and understanding that by bringing new stakeholders into the company, you kind of change that uh, control analysis and you might actually be inviting um, investors or stakeholders to the table that uh, conceivably could be demanding some special rights or some special controls and that kind of thing. So really important, again, to get good advice at this stage so you can sort of work your way through all of those pieces. Um, when we say the friends and family round, uh, who are we talking about and who, who are startups um, and small businesses allowed to raise money from? This isn't as uh, who you can go out and solicit money and investment from and, and make shareholders of your company. This is something that is tightly regulated by uh, securities laws in Canada. So securities laws says there's certain buckets of people that as a small business, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, you are allowed to approach to sell securities, to sell common shares or to sell equity in your business uh, to make them investors. And there's certain people that you're not allowed to approach. So um, again, to understand who those, uh, those people are, that's something that you should certainly be getting some, some legal advice and some guidance around. Now, just to give you an example, um, the typical, uh, the typical startup, the typical small business relies on an exemption under Canadian securities laws that's referred to as the private issuer exemption. The private issuer exemption generally applies to uh, small businesses and uh, but there's a few sort of preconditions that you need to make sure you have in place. One of which you need to have in place when you create your company. So that's an, an important thing to, uh, to suss out with uh, a legal advisor when you're first getting set up. Uh, the private issue exemption says essentially that you can sell shares, you can sell uh, an ownership stake in your company to um, directors, officers, founders of the company. Uh, that's the founder stage, which we talked about. Um, you can sell to parents, spouses, brothers, sisters, family members of the founders, of the directors, of the officers, close personal friends of, again, that tight group of the, of the company, as well as close business associates. Now, there's all kinds of tricky little rules under securities laws about, uh, you know, how many close personal friends you can have and how many close business associates you can have before you, know, you start sort of uh, stepping outside of what's permitted under securities laws. So again, really, really important to, uh, to have that chat with uh, an advisor to make sure that you're sort of doing this in compliance with, um, with appropriate laws. Uh, the last bullet point here I have is uh, what are you selling? Uh, this is really talking about the, the type of um, security or equity that you're selling in your company. Um, and again, this goes back to sort of the strategic discussion with your advisor and with your co-founder team about um, what type of control are you willing to give up? Um, and well, essentially what kind of control you're, you're willing to give up. So do you want to give away voting shares in your company? Do you want to give away non-voting shares? That type of thing. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying, what type of security are you selling? Um, from a legal documentation side of things, what we typically will need here uh, is a subscription agreement, which is uh, essentially a contract between the company and the investor, which sets out uh, sort of the the, the contractual terms of the investment, as well as a number of reps and warranties that uh, as the company is really important for you to get from each of your um, investors so that you can show regulator, if you were ever asked to, you can say, well, this is how I know I complied with uh, securities laws because I got these um, confirmations from my potential investors. So again, there's some nuance to this. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated and it certainly uh, rolls into the world of uh, securities law. So definitely something that if you're at this stage of your business, you should be seeking, uh, you should be seeking some legal advice for.
Yeah, Josh, I just remember back to our round and, uh, you know, having to fill out the form for each investor or most of the investors and explaining how I knew them and uh, how long I'd known them and, uh, you know, why we were such good friends that they could invest in my startup idea. Um, one quick question here that popped up in the chat that I thought we'd just address right now is, does federal incorporation change the available pool of friends and family investors as compared to a provincial incorporation? Uh, short answer, no. Generally, we have different provincial jurisdictions uh, for corporate law, and we have also different provincial jurisdictions for securities laws. Uh, but in the in the realm of the private issuer exemption, these laws are, are essentially harmonized across all of the provinces. Um, there might be slight nuances uh, with the private issuer exemption in one province versus another, but generally they're uh, they're pretty well harmonized. And uh, you know, the 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 way friends and family work in one province versus another might be slightly different, which is you know why you always sort of need to engage an advisor when you're going through this. But the the broad concepts still apply across jurisdictions. Awesome. Hopefully that answered your question, Ed. So again, just touching on uh, the good lawyer experience, um, much like I can't, couldn't stress the, you know, having those sort of difficult conversations early on with your, with your co-founders, I can't stress this enough either, which is you gotta, gotta be building trusted relationships early. Um, you know, the team kind of jokes, I'm pretty well known as a perpetual seed planter. I am planting seeds with people all the time about getting them involved in the company, whether it's from a, a team perspective or an investor perspective. And rest assured that that activity, that seed planting early days, um, the passion that I have for Good Lawyer and really exuding that every time I see these people, um, Josh being one of those unfortunate souls back in the day, um, really set me up when it came time to raise money. Um, second, I've touched on this a little bit, the Alberta Investor Tax Credit. Again, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore in Alberta. Hopefully they bring it back, but it's still a form of it exists, I believe in BC, Ontario, and a lot of the other provinces. I know Saskatchewan and Manitoba have huge investor tax credits. And this was a huge tool, really nice tool in terms of getting everyone on the same page when it came to valuation, because what the ITC did was gave a 30% rebate to the investor for any amounts invested in Goodware at the time. So if you can find these incentive programs, ways to leverage government funds and bake that in to the overall value prop when you're going to investors, it really greases the wheels and it certainly did for Good Lawyer. Um, on the same sort of tone, the AITC had an expiry date, which helped me massively in establishing urgency. But even if you don't have something as cut and dry as we did at the time, establishing urgency is key. Uh, you know, I hear lots of stories of founders or, you know, CEOs just disappearing for six months while they're on the investor train. And I don't, I don't prescribe that at all. Uh, you know, we have a business to build. And so when it comes to raising money, trying to establish that urgency and make sure everyone's very aware of it and build that hot deal um, with that sense of urgency is really what was successful for me personally. And what I've seen successful um, with other founders you know, I'm, if anyone's familiar with Randy Thompson, uh, ain't, you know, one of the top angels in Calgary, he always talks about the skip the dishes deal. And if you watch the trajectory of that deal, it was hot. So establishing urgency and competition, leaning on your champions. If you get someone with a name or with some experience willing to invest in you and to, allowing you to talk about it, you should talk about it aggressively. And uh, again, for me, Josh was one of our early investors and rest assured everyone that I was going to that knew Josh after that knew that Josh was investing in good lawyer because that was like the Josh stamp of approval, which really helped me get uh, a few of the, you know, more on the fencers over the line. So um, build trust early, leverage any incentives you can get that hot deal by establishing urgency and lean on your early investors um, as sort of that stamp of approval to, to make everyone else a little more comfortable. Josh, do you have anything to add to that? 
Uh, I think we can just sort of jump into uh, the key lessons here as a sort of our wrap up and then maybe we can start jumping on some questions because I see my, I have a chat bubble with 26 on it. So it looks like people are, are active. Sounds good. So again, we wanted to leave a little bit more time for questions today. So I will rip through these and then uh, the floor will be wide open for any questions. So if you have anything burning, please put it in the chat now because we are very happy to answer them. And by we, I mostly mean Josh. Um, so number one, co-founders are everything until they leave. Make sure that the people you start a company with are committed to the same vision. And as things change, make sure you have the right agreements in place. So a co-founder leaving doesn't derail the entire company. Number two, friends and family is harder than it sounds. Um, you know, we, I was in a really good position. I've been planting those seeds early and I can promise you it was still uh, a long few weeks trying to get people over the line. And, you know, a lot of those folks had written the biggest check of their lives and handed it to me. And that's a big deal. So don't just think that, oh, friends and family, they're going to give me cash. No, they want to know you have an idea, that you have a plan and that you're not gonna burn their money. Three, good lawyers, you know, a little plug there, help you raise faster and on better terms, unquestionably. Uh, you know, again, we were at the benefit of being surrounded by lawyers, so that came pretty naturally to us, but I've seen startup after startup go to try to raise funds without having, you know, their internal workings organized and in a good state, and it will derail it in a heartbeat if, uh, Investors start to sniff some fishiness going on within the internal structuring of the company. Again, total derailer if you're trying to raise funds, especially as you start working your way down that ladder into friends and family and then VCs and angels. Um, finally, you, my friend, are the driving force. Raising investment capital is hard and it takes perseverance. Uh, I've heard lots of no's, but thankfully a few more yeses. So, you know, my experience and just some of the experience of startup founders, you got to grit your teeth and just keep chugging because if you're not going to be the one to raise your company money, who is? And then uh, again, we got the free advice. Uh, I'll just leave that on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, answer any questions that uh, you folks have. So, Brett, I will jump on uh, one that I saw kind of come through the, the chat a couple of times and it's kind of um, dealing with this same concept of uh, offering securities and selling selling um, shares and equity in your company across jurisdictions, whether that's in a different province or in a different country or in, I've seen at least one question specific um, to the U.S. So without getting into sort of the specifics of um, the laws and that type of thing, uh, what I would say just as a general principle for the company, you need uh, an exemption to be able to get out of the jurisdiction where your company is based. So if I'm uh, an Alberta company, I need the private issuer exemption, which is available to me in Alberta to be able to get out of Alberta to sell to a close personal friend or a close business associate in, let's say, British Columbia, for example, or Ontario, for example. On the flip side, that Ontario investor or that um, BC investor needs their own exemption to be able to buy securities in, uh, in Alberta. Now, like I said, in the Canadian context, this is all uh, pretty well harmonized and essentially just works across all jurisdictions. Um, there's a little bit more nuance when you're dealing with uh, selling securities into the United States and selling securities abroad. Let's say you have a close personal friend in the UK or something like that. Uh, in those instances, as a company, you're really relying on the subscriber saying that yes, they are eligible to buy those securities. But again, um, when you do have sort of cross-border stuff, especially internationally, that's a, a really important time to, uh, to dig into the specific sort of nuances of that uh, with your legal advisor, because particularly the world of securities laws is very, very nuanced and very, very fact-dependent. So we can't really give too many just uh, broad 
yes or no answers in that in those contexts. Thanks, Josh. Um, another one. I, sorry, I just blurred out for a second. Um, did you already address what would qualify as a close business relationship? Uh, so the the close personal friend and the close business relationship, those are um, they're kind of a, a little bit of ambiguous. There's some guidance under securities laws about what those constitute, but Brett, you'll remember from uh, from the subscription agreements that we did at for for Good Lawyer from the founder side, you have the, uh, the obligation uh, to be able to explain. Um, there's a standard form for each of these exemptions where uh, you have to explain really the, the context of how you know the close personal friend or the close business associate, the number of years that you've known them for and that kind of thing. So the onus is on, is on the, uh, the founder, the company to be able to, the connection with the company to be able to provide that information. Yeah, again, not a... Not something that I can give a, a clear answer without, again, some some nuance and some specific facts around the particular circumstance. Absolutely. Um, to Simon, uh, regarding the business grants and government funding programs, absolutely. Um, in fact, we're actually going to be hosting a webinar ideally next month, uh, very similar to this, but going through all of the government funding that Good lawyer was able to capture in the past year. Um, obviously, that was accentuated by uh, all the COVID, but there are tons of programs and, and more. We just learned about even more uh, a couple of days ago. There are so many programs and they're a pain in the ass to apply for, unquestionably, but there are a lot of programs um, funding you know, innovative companies in pretty much every single field. Kevin, how many VC rounds has Good Lawyer led from a legal perspective? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. If you mean as a company, how many have we done ourselves? It would be zero. We haven't we haven't run a VC round yet. And if you're in, talking about in terms of the lawyers on the platform, um, many. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Another one, Josh. If the corporation, if a corporation is the investor rather than an individual. How does the corporation qualify under the exemptions or how does that, what's that interplay? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, this is, again, it's a little bit nuanced how you walk through the securities laws, but generally speaking, um, let's say if I'm the close personal friend of, of Brett, the founder, I can generally invest through a holding company that I own. Um, because the like the close personal friend relationship is between uh, myself and Brett, but there is a, a way that you can walk through securities laws to allow the investment to actually be held in a, in a corporate entity or a trust or a partnership or something like that. Uh, but the relationship has to be between, um, you know, the, the individual behind that corporate entity. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. And then uh, just a quick note here to uh, Amit about how much are the approximate legal costs associated with a friends and family round? Uh, I hate to say it, but it totally depends. Um, how many shareholders, what type of agreement are you putting in place? Um, if it's pretty straightforward, ours had a number of shareholders, but the actual documentation was pretty straightforward. And if Josh and I hadn't done that ourselves, I would have ballparked that at probably um, three to 5,000 in fees to do the whole process, uh, which yeah. I think from a comparative standpoint, um, you know, is probably less than half what you'd see at a traditional firm. So one thing that I would, uh, add on to that, you know, the, the question of, you know, how expensive is it going to be from a legal side to raise money, uh, really depends on how you structure that investment. And when I talked about this issue of, um, you know, strategically thinking through, control and that type of thing. If you, if the only way you can get 
uh, friends and family money into your company is by giving up a substantial amount of control or special rights in your business. The way that you can sort of come up um, with allocating those special rights to investors is through typically through a, a shareholder agreement. And if you are in the context where you have to now introduce a shareholder agreement into your financing and to create these special rights, that massively complicates the financing and it will, you know, as you complicate it, that'll increase uh, the cost. So, you know, a great rule of thumb uh, for early stage, you know, the founder, the early stage founder investment and the early stage friends and family, it's a really key things absolutely as simple as possible. That'll not only will that sort of help you raise faster, they'll keep the legal costs down and generally just keep everything um, more simple and easily digested as you move through that pathway towards institutional money. The institutional money that comes from venture capital and from uh, angel investors and private equity and that kind of thing, those professional investors are going to certainly, certainly um, insist that they have special rights uh, related to your company before they give you an investment. So they might say, yeah, we'll give you X million dollars, but we need a board seat. We need uh, a drag along, right? We need uh, certain preferential treatment as a, as a shareholder in your business. So a great rule of thumb is to resist giving up those special rights as long as possible to one, keep your business and um, structure looking more simple and to uh, maintain your own control of your business until you get to the stage where well, the only way that, a, that an institutional firm is going to deal with me and give me money is if I'm willing to give up some of these controls and allocate some of these special rights. A couple of quick hitters on questions coming through here. Um, to Alan, as to uh, a communal like or good lawyer like hub, I would say, uh, for government grant writers, I've never seen it. Um, we have a few folks that help us out and we've got Zach internally who pretty much takes care of everything. Um, but if you come across it, please send it my way. Cause I'd be certainly very curious. Um, and then to John about the strategic partnership. So his question is what if there is a strategic partnership for investment in the form of reduced services? The example given is the business gets 20% of your company for reduced service costs and other incentives. Um, Josh, feel free to chime in on this, but my reaction to that would be, sounds a lot like sweat equity. So whatever value you'd be attributing to that reduction in service costs to me, whether it was another company or an individual, that sounds a lot like sweat equity. So, you know, we've done that with employees where they take a reduced salary and get some options to top it up. It would sound to me similar, regardless of whether it was an individual or whether it was a business that was, uh, you know, providing those services at a discount. Yeah, agreed. That, that definitely sounds like the sweat equity context. Uh, again, anytime you have a sweat equity uh, sort of scenario, it's good to think through um, essentially uh, some sort of mechanism uh, if the counterparty is willing to maybe claw back all or a percentage of the securities if the sweat equity doesn't you know, if, if that service provider doesn't end up providing this, the sweat equity that, that's contemplated, so you wouldn't want to give up 20% of your company uh, on the expectation that the service provider is going to do a certain thing and then have no recourse if they, if they don't provide the service and now, uh, now they own 20% of your company. And sort of an overarching comment that I would have is, um, and again, this kind of comes back to getting a lawyer that understands your business and your goals is keep it as simple as possible. It can quickly spiral into some really complex agreements and triggers in particular, you know, kind of going back to that idea of the founder agreement and establishing, you know, what the roles and expectations are. The simpler you can create in terms of triggers, whether it's time frame, the better. Because as you start to get performance-based, if, if it's going to be performance-based, it had better be very clear and ascertainable, the fuzzier you get with these types of agreements, the more difficult and contentious it's gonna get down the road. Josh, here's uh, one that maybe you'll have an answer for, maybe not, from Yusra. 
what are some of the common special rights requested by a friends and family round, sorry, by friends and family versus VCs? And what are some of the most ridiculous um, requests or stipulations have you seen? Uh, good question. So as a general principle, um, as a founder, I would not want it to be giving up special rights at the friends and family round at all, if you can help it. Um, I, I think that's just a, that's just a good principle to uh, um, kind of roll with as a founder. If, if you have friends and family that are coming in and contributing, um, which, you know, I don't mean to suggest that this is not a lot of money for potential investors, but if people are bringing three, five, ten thousand dollars to your company and expect to have um, special control rights that roll along with those uh, uh, contributions, I would suggest that that money is probably too expensive for you to take in the door. Uh, the reason why the venture capital firms and the private equity and the angel investors um, get to insist on having special rights coming along uh, with their investment is because they're typically writing uh, a very large check. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, which is going to be very material to whether you can sort of continue to follow your, your business dreams. And not only that, they typically are bringing, um, you know, a wealth of, of experience and their own sort of uh, advisory skills and value add to your business. So I think that's a good rule of thumb. Um, it's just thinking about how expensive it is to get that money in the door and, and part of the costs and how I would evaluate whether money is expensive is, are you being asked to give up, uh, to give up rights? You know, every investor that comes into your, your business at the friends and family stage, uh, if you're giving them voting shares, they'll have basic uh, rights that are, you know, available to common shareholders under corporate law, which is completely reasonable. And, you know, in this, in this world of uh, keeping things simple, it makes sense to say, okay, um, I'm willing to raise money from friends and family. I'm willing to give friends and family the same um, type of shares, the same class of stock that I own as the founder. But I'm just going to design it so that at the end of the day, I own a majority of the shares in the company so that I maintain control and still um, can run my business the way that I want to as the founder. So that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, at the VC level, I don't know if I would say things that I've seen ridiculous asks from VCs, but at the VC level, very common special rights that you're gonna see requested is uh, um, board seats. Um, that is, uh, is very, very common. So we're gonna have somebody from the venture capital firm likely sitting at the decision-making table of your business. Um, lots of times they're gonna ask for uh, special exit rights. The way the venture capital business model works is that they want to grow your business um, by uh, several orders of magnitude to an event where they can liquidate their, uh, their ownership and get out and collect a big check. So VC firms are betting on hundreds of companies in the startup space, um, and they're accepting that many and many of those uh, investments, those bets that they place will, uh, will fail because it's, you know, as you all know, it's a very competitive and very challenging world to be a, a small business entrepreneur or a startup entrepreneur. Um, but the VC is hoping that uh, one of those businesses or a handful of those businesses hit it big. So they're going to want some sort of mechanism built into their investment that allows them to liquidate or even to maybe force the company um, to accept a sale or to go public or something like that, which are sort of the traditional ways that um, institutional investors uh, kind of uh, make money off of their investment in your startup. Yeah, and at the same token, sort of in the inverse, um, they might restrict a sale because, you know, the upside of you doubling or tripling from their, you know, from their investment date isn't enough to get them excited. That could be to you cashing out for millions and millions of dollars, 
but that might not be exciting to the VC. So another thing you have to keep in mind is if you're going to be taking VC money, you better be ready to play this game for a very, very long time because you might have to, it might be your only option. Um, the one other anecdote I thought I'd just like rip off was, uh, I had a very interesting pre-seed round when it comes to friends and family, because I think I had a disproportionate number of lawyers in that round. And as you can probably imagine, the individual lawyers had lots of questions for me. And ultimately the way that I sort of bulldozed through those questions was pretty simple. I had two investors that came in with really, really big checks and the rest were coming in with relatively small checks. And so as soon as I had the two big investors on board, with the way that I wanted to structure it, everyone else, if they wanted in, had to follow the same rules. And having those big investors on board with our structure really paved the way for the rest of the people to, you know, sort of fall in line and, you know, not dig into the control piece. Because the way that we're set up is I effectively have all the voting rights, but everybody has common shares just like me. So we are on the same ride together, but. I'm the decision maker right now. And that will change. There will be more decision makers at the table when we look to get that VC funding at a later stage. Um, but really having that alignment and trust amongst the shareholders, which started with the champions, the big investors and getting them on board has really paved the way for very few issues. And uh, so far, a lot of happy investors. And that's Brad, a great example of the uh lean on your champions principle that you were talking about earlier in the presentation, right? And um, you're absolutely right. If, if somebody's come in for a, a huge chunk of change and they were happy to do it on, on these terms, if I'm coming in for a few thousand bucks, well, I don't really have a whole bunch of leverage to ask for, to ask for something that that other guy was, was comfortable giving me money without. Yeah, it, it really is, for, at least from my experience at the you know early stages, the pre-seed, the seed rounds, it's definitely more of an art than a science. And so, you know, getting those champions was for me, for sure, the number one um, reason we were able to successfully close our last round. Um, you just can't stress that enough. Well, with that, everybody, um, last chance, if there's any questions, please fire them in the chat and, uh, if that's it, then uh, we'll give you a couple minutes back here as we wrap up the day. Uh, before we close off this webinar, I just want to thank both uh, you, Brett and Josh for such a fantastic presentation. We have a lot of thank yous coming into the chat too. So um, thanks so much for the information on behalf of everyone that attended. We know, we know this could be tricky. We're, you know, I came from a world where I couldn't help entrepreneurs in the way that I wanted to. And, uh, it's difficult, but it's, it's doable. And uh, raising money to, to scale a company is a pretty exciting thing. So uh, I wish you guys all the best and uh, hope to see you at one of our upcoming webinars. And don't forget to use the free promo code if you have a question and you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with a lawyer like Josh. Good luck, everybody. Thanks very much. Cheers.